All right. How's everybody doing? Yeah. I mean, I, it didn't, it was, are y'all amped for the, the rise gatherings on the beach? I mean, I know Dave is. Dave's up here, you know, he's, he's really excited. But I was like, man, this is, it, I was, I, we are, we've been talking about this for a couple months and trying to keep a secret. Me and Dave are pretty excitable uh, and, hard, and we can't keep secrets either. So it's like we were trying to, and we, we didn't want to announce something like, you know, hey, we got this great idea. And then everybody's disappointed because we can't do it because of logistics or the city or something. So we're like, keep it under wraps until we can get everything confirmed and get everything planned out. And so we've been waiting, but what an amazing idea. As we're talking about in our series, if you haven't been with us, we've been in this series, Reverb. And the idea is that, you know, as we share our faith, as we go out into the world, into our neighborhoods and across the globe. In fact, I think we have one of our global missionaries from Honduras here. Carter Jackson is here. Hey, give him a hand. He's home. He's headed back. Recently engaged. Congratulations. And look at that. You have one and then all of a sudden, just with a ring, two missionaries. Bang, bang. It happens like that. Um, but that's the idea, like what Carter's doing and what God's called us all to do. Everybody in the room, if you're a follower of Jesus, we are called to be reverberators of the gospel. We've said this in this series all along. We didn't create the song of redemption. We didn't create the melody. We didn't play the chord of redemption. We weren't the ones that died on the cross, death, burial, and resurrection, sins annihilated at the foot of the cross. We didn't do any of those things. We can't raise anybody from the dead. Only Jesus can do that. But, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we get to reverberate that truth. God has given us that grace and mercy and love, and now we have the privilege of carrying it. And that's exactly what's been happening century over century over century over century across geography since, since the cross of Jesus Christ, since his death, burial, and resurrection, on the praises and on the voices and on the lives of people, fallen and broken people, in fact, like you and me, have been carrying this message carrying this good news, carrying the real life Holy Spirit inside of them and pushing it outward, reverberating it to people. That's been the, the whole idea. And we've talked in the first four weeks, like this idea of it's, it's not just how do I get in a conversation with somebody about Jesus in, in this time of 2020 where it's really awkward, you know, got the religious right, you got all this weird stuff attached to Christianity. But beyond that, expanding out to a bigger and a more holistic idea of reverberation, this idea that your life your whole life is this magnet that God's pulled, pulled together as he's brought you from death to life to reverberate out the message of the gospel. What does it look like to be a city on a hill? That they would see our lives, that they would see our freedom and our hope. Not that we're better than anybody else up on the hill, but that we are anchored to Jesus. And our eyes are fixed on something different that in difficult circumstances, we live life differently. But not only that, like last week, it's not just our lives, because a lot of people will say, hey, you can preach the gospel without saying a word. Eventually, you got to use words. Eventually, you're going to engage people. And when you do, it's got to be done not just with truth, like we said last week, not just with love, but truth in love or truth in tears. We should be speaking the truth and the beauty of the gospel with uncomprom uncompromisingly. The word of God is the word of God. But in the midst of that, we do it with tears. As Jesus came with compassion, he never sacrificed truth. But he also never sacrificed the way that he met people in the margins and he was compassionate with people. We go with that balance. So now is the make it or break it day. Like this is exciting because today what we're going to talk about, anybody can do it. I'm not saying that it's easy. But the mechanics of what, what we're, we'll see in Scripture today in terms of sharing our faith and carrying the gospel to, our, to the world around us, everybody can do it. It doesn't matter because the thing that you hear a lot in church world you know, is, you know I, don't know, I don't know anything. They're going to ask me about the dinosaurs. They're going to ask me about you know, evolution, creation. They're going to ask me weird questions. We're going to get in this philosophical argument. It's not going to go well. What we're talking about today takes all of that off the table. It's, it's a... It's the starting ground that I think we have to get to first. I think we jump to that, you know, conversation about, you know, the age of the earth before. That's just not in the, in the mix or in the framework yet. We have to develop leverage in a relationship first. And today is really about orbiting. Dave talked a few weeks ago about gravity. Like, your life should be a gravitational pull for other people. Not because you're awesome, but because Jesus inside you is awesome. But for you and me, how do we get people in the strange culture we're in to orbit around Jesus? Because it's like, who wants to be around the things of God? I mean, because people have this distorted view of Christianity that are, that are outsiders. They're coming in and they, see, they don't see the, you know, this unending ocean of grace that we call Jesus. They see judgment. They see hypocrisy. They see all the things that they want to see. How do we get people in proximity to Jesus? How do we get them to orbit around Jesus? I mean, that is step one. I mean, we always try to figure out, what do, what do we do? You know, how do I share, we share our faith? 
getting people in proximity to Jesus. Antley Fowler, who was my pastor before I came and planted this church, he sent me here. Uh, probably to get rid of me. Get out of here. Um, no, we really good friends. And when, when I saw the beautiful nature of how River City was planted and it had all these, just the diversity of somebody that had been a Christian one minute to somebody who had been a Christian for 40 years, somebody that was from this d- denomination, just all different denominations, all different backgrounds, people sitting there that had no idea, deer in the headlights, didn't believe in Jesus. I said, how, what, what are you, like, what's going on here and how did this happen? Because this looks amazing and it looks like something that we should all be doing as we're leading churches. He said, I, as a young life leader and as a pastor, God's always called me to this simplicity because I'm just, he was always self-deprecating. He's like, I don't know a whole lot. He goes, but I can get people to orbit around Jesus. And my job as a pastor is get, starting with step one, getting our people to do this and getting, getting people in the proximity with other people that love Jesus, who have the light of Christ in them. Because, man, that is a good start in bringing somebody and showing, re-imaging the broken image that people have of what it means to be a follower of Christ is getting people to orbit around Jesus. And I started thinking about, okay, what does that look like for you and me? It made me immediately think of my mom, like this idea of, like this kind of pandemic or epidemic uh, of, of people, like not, not the disease epidemic p- pandemic that we're thinking about, but like when something just grows, like all of a sudden one person's orbiting around something and then other people are. I'm a science guy. I could get into all kinds of illustrations here in a minute, but I'm not. Um, but the, what does it look like to get a, a lot of people around? And my mom, when I was, I've made fun of, and I apologize but like I've, I've like people that are very into like granola, you know, no processed sugar in your house because you don't love your children. Um, and I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I know you love your children. That's why you don't give them that trash. But uh, give them a popsicle every once in a while if you really love them. Um, but I, I I I have some grounding there. Like I make fun, and I've, people have been mad at me, and I've had to spam block you. Um, but I've I I grew up in that household. My mom, that was my mom. Like I dry wheat toast and you know fresh squeezed orange juice and a hard boiled egg every day for breakfast. I never had sugared cereal. I mean, it was like granola. If you want to sweeten it, it was wheat germ. I would go over to friends' houses that I didn't even like just because they had Lucky Charms over there. I mean, that was the way that I, I mean, I just, and then one day my mom, classic boy's mom, like she just, she was so good at, at being a boy's mom. She didn't want, she was like, I want our house to be the refuge. I want our house to be where all the other dudes come, where all your friends come, where all your people come. I don't want y'all to just scatter and go everywhere else. Like, she was mother hen. She wanted to bring them all in. She's like, I want to take care of them. I want them here. So one day, and this all kind of happened all of a sudden. I think it was my sophomore year in high school. We had a swimming pool, which people orbit around swimming pools as well, especially in Florida and Tallahassee, which is like a wet sock with humidity. Um, People... uh, she, I had friends that would, would come over, but I, I invited one or two friends over. And then one day, my mom, after we got done swimming, you know when you're done swimming, you're like, man, I, I could eat anything right now. Um, and she came out with, like, this tray of hot dogs. I mean, you talk about, you know, granola mom with hot dogs. That just doesn't happen. Like, this tray of hot dogs individually wrapped in tinfoil, steamed inside the bun, like magic for a kid. Like, this is amazing. God exists. You know, it's amazing. And we, we, I couldn't believe this. My mom, and there was Kool-Aid on the tray. And do you anybody remember soft batch cookies? They set you free. I mean, Jesus comes right when you eat it. It's amazing. And all of a sudden, it was like everybody found out. You go to the Harmon's house, you go swimming. Miss Harmon's going to come out with this tray of magic that is just going to, it's going to blow you away. And it was like one or two friends. We, I didn't even have to, I, at one point I had to just stop inviting people. Because my mom's like, I don't know that we've, we're going to have a miracle literally is going to have to happen for us to multiply some food if, if people keep coming over. And when I was a senior in high school, I was, we were doing two-a-day football practices. I didn't invite anybody to my house. I had one guy. I said, hey, let's go swimming and then go take a nap between practices. And half the football team came. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, it was, it was, it was nuts. And I say that to say there's something to that. Like when we look at the landscape of Scripture, something that, that you see – and how people begin to orbit around other people is hospitality. And that doesn't sound like this, you know, groundbreaking biblical thing, but invi- like when we're thinking about how does this begin? Okay, we've taken this reverb of our lives, the way that we operate in the world certainly can reverberate, but when we want to really engage people actively, when we're actually taking, like 2 Corinthians 5 says, the ministry of reconciliation out into the world, how do we begin this idea of Orbit, getting people to orbit and hospitality actually might have something to say to you and me. 
Because years ago, like evangelism, and if you've been in church for a while, grew up in church, I mean, there was the EE evangelism, evangelism explosion, anybody, I'm older. Um, and that was, you know, there was the door-to-door stuff, there was the beach, there was the tracks, you know, people would go door-to-door and they'd hand you a track and they'd say, flip it over, say this prayer, and they would say the prayer, I am a sinner, and they would go through the whole thing, and they didn't even know what they're saying, and then you're like marking your book, I got another one saved, and you would go to the next house. I mean, that is not, I mean, that, there was nothing good about that, because you're telling somebody a lie, like, your life's been transformed, and they're like, I read a sheet of paper. So we kind of flushed that down the toilet in the late 90s and the early 2000s, but we never replaced it with anything. Like, all of a sudden, now it's like, bring your friend, to, you know, bring your people to church, you know, and then relational evangelism out, out in the world, but nobody's really telling anybody how to do it. They're like, it kind of leans on the, the church a little bit, like, Derek, I brought my atheist friend today. Are you on your game? Did you make you another cup of coffee? You got any, yeah, you better be, is it, who's speaking today? Is it not, what, what's going on right today? I got, I got people in here. And don't make it weird. If worship goes long, can you intervene? You know, if somebody's doing something weird up front in worship, and my friends, we, you know, he's not going to understand. You know, we don't, that's not the, the vibe that we are running with in the church. The, 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 the evangelism doesn't sit in the pastor's bucket. I'm like you, with me and my family trying to figure out what it looks like to live out my faith outside these walls. What does it look like for me to be a missionary in my neighborhood and around the globe? What does it look like for me to carry this beautiful thing that we have, this gift, the light of Christ to the world? And hospitality may have something to say about that as we look at it in Scripture. David Mathis says this before we jump into Hebrews chapter 13, which if you've got your Bible, that's where we'll be launching today. He says, in a progressively post-Christian society, the importance of hospitality as an evangelistic asset is growing rapidly. We're certainly in a post-Christian society, wouldn't you say? He's saying, this may be it. He says, increasingly, the most strategic turf, which to engage the unbelieving with the good news of Jesus, may be the turf of our own homes. And I read that last, it was actually uh, three weeks ago, and it just started me on this thing, like, under, trying to understand hospitality. When you think of hospitality, you're like, Martha Stewart, yay, we got to, you know, bake cookies with things, and... But hospitality from a biblical sense is completely different. And as you study hospitality, when we see it in the New Testament, in the Koine Greek, listen to this. This is what what it means. The word for hospitality is um, philoxenia, philoxenia, which it's kind of the root word. Like when you, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, that's Philadelphia. That's love of the people that I know, my brothers and sisters. That's that. Philoxenia is love of the stranger or love of the outsider. It literally means love for outsiders, hospitality. Now, that blows my mind. I know you're like, hey, get to it. i got to figure out what you're talking about. When you look at hospitality in Scripture, many times the way that we interpret it is hanging out with my Christian brothers and sisters. Like, that's what it's supposed to be. And certainly, there's an element to that all through Scripture. We should, we should get together. We should do communion together. We should break bread together. We should hang out in our city groups together. We should come together for church. We should never forsake meeting together. But when it comes to hospitality, the way that we see it in Scripture, this word actually means love of the outsider. No more stranger danger. Like we're in that weird culture where it's like, don't talk to strangers. I mean, when you're five, you probably shouldn't. But we're no longer five. We should be inviting the outsider in. And we see this over and over. In Hebrews 13, you see it right here. It says, let brotherly love continue. As the author is instructing the church and instructing you and me. He says, let let brotherly love continue. So we should be engaging the people around us with love. But also do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I mean, I don't know, that just sounds crazy to me. Like, don't neglect, like, he, it, it's, it's got all of it in there, the hospitality word and strangers. So it's like, I'm, I'm going to make sure you understand this. And what the author is actually referring to is something that's in the, the Old Testament, like the, the, the reference to Genesis and the three strangers that roll in. If you don't know the story, Moses is, you know, getting along in years. They're wondering, you know, what, what, what's going to happen with him and his wife? She's going to have a baby. God had promised. They're going to be this, you know, father of many nations and all this stuff's going to happen. And... These three strangers come in. They're very hospitable to him. He's like, get the bread, honey. You got you to get in here. They are hospitable, and they find out these are angels. These are servants of the Lord actually from heaven and entertaining the Lord himself. But the idea here is do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And this is a theme all throughout Scripture, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament. All throughout Scripture. 
God is, leans towards his people and says, you should be hospitable to the foreigner. You should be hospitable to the outsider. Just ancient cultures in general, it was a huge value to have hospitable people because there wasn't hotels. You had to know people that had space and that you could go hang out because people really didn't know. It's not like today where you, you know, you know somebody in Colorado, you know somebody in California, you know somebody in New York. Back then it was like you knew the people that lived near you. There was no other way to know unless you were willing to get on the danger. And it was dangerous back then to travel because you didn't know people. You couldn't trust people. You didn't have the police for it. You didn't have the stuff we got. And so they, traveling was, was dangerous. So when you did travel, hospitality, knowing somebody that was hospitable was beneficial to the stranger. And there would be this whole process, this whole thing. And it, was, it wasn't like kind of low-key. There, there was a four-part process in the ancient world to, to that whole thing. Inviting somebody, greeting somebody once they come over, then providing for them, not just giving them a granola bar and booting them out, but like, we're going to feast. We're going to blow your socks off as we serve you and then send you off with love. That was the idea of the hospitality in the ancient world. So this has been around for a long time. But it changes. Think about it. If we're thinking about hospitality and we're opening up the idea that this isn't just hanging out with my homies, hanging out with my, my, I'm a small front porch person. I only have the capacity for a few people, and these are my friends, and I can't really stretch beyond these, these walls. This idea of hospitality, which is not really just a good idea, but it's really a command that we see throughout Scripture, is the idea of inviting people into your home that you wouldn't likely invite. Like, not just people that have the same affinities that you, but people that are outside your normal reference of invitation, but people that might be in your proximity, and it's all over Scripture. It changes. Think about this. We've read this verse before, Romans 12, 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. We've been singing and, and, and praying for these things in the church. Contribute to the needs of the saints. We should contribute to each other's needs. We should take care of the missionaries. We should support the people in our church. We should do those things and seek to show hospitality. When I saw that, I used to always think we should Give them things, the people that we know, the people in the church, and we should have them over for dinner. Like our church people, dinner on the grounds, you know. Let's hang out with them. Let's, have, let's, let's get people together after church. We're going to go to V Pizza. We're going to bring all our church people there, and we're going to hang out with church people. But the word doesn't mean that. It literally is bring the alien, the stranger, the non-citizen into your world, get them in orbit around other people that can show them the light of Christ that is in you. It's what the word means. I go and I keep going. First Timothy, the, the, the qualifications for the, the shepherds and the leaders of the church, the people that are leading the church, God puts it in here purposefully. I read this, and you always skip by it. You always think about the, the ones like an overseer must be above reproach, husband of one wife. Or like, these all make sense. He should be a sober guy. He should be self-controlled. He should be respectable. If he's not respectable, he shouldn't be an elder. Hospitable. We don't think about that that much when we're thinking about elders. Like, that guy's great. Is he somebody that reaches out to the outsider and brings them into his home, into his world? I mean, I could say, that I, honestly, when I look at our church and I look at our elders, we do have those type of elders. I mean, you look, Darren Vinger, I mean, he's got people orbiting in his world constantly. One of the most hospitable people on the planet. Dan Cooter, same thing. I mean, always out in the midst of it. The McFerrins, I mean, the Berries, I mean, they are orbit hospitality people. I'm thankful. When I look at these, I'm like, ooh, we're going to have to fire an elder? No, they're pretty good. I like them. They're not too bad. These, well thought of by outsiders, it says in 1 Timothy. So what does that mean for you and me? Let's get into some practical stuff and then we'll get out of here. This is like easy stuff, but not, but it's, it's uh, wrong word. Simple stuff, but not easy, right? This is simple, this idea. Hospitality. Fight people over, treat people well. So these points will be simple, but not easy. One, engage people. I mean, this is a no-brainer, so we're not going to spend too long here, but I want to kind of give you an idea. Like Matthew 28, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're not going to be able to do that unless we go out and we engage people. It just ain't going to happen. We've got to be in contact with people. That's what Jesus did. He engaged people. He was on the ground with the people in the margins, the sick, the poor, the sinner, the prostitute, the tax collector, the people that were not at all like Jesus. Jesus was sinless. He hung out with sinners, people in the margin. He engaged people. What? For the purpose of leading them, going after the one. The 99 righteous people, hey, 
they look like they're, you know, they, you know, they think they, they look like they should look. And I'm going to go here, and I'm going to pull in the outsider. It's what Jesus did. Story of the woman at the well, you can look at it over and over again. C.S. Lewis says this. I love this quote because it, it makes me think of viewing human beings differently, not viewing them as the project that, that you, like, I went to the door, and I gave them the track. They signed the thing, and now they're a Christian. But looking at people like humans, like these are people. These are people, and, and C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, you've never met a mere mortal. He's saying you've never met anybody that's not eternal. Depends on, you know, where they're going to end up or what, what their eternity looks like depends. But you've never met a mere mortal. You've never met a human not created to image your God. That is mind-blowing because you look at certain people like, I don't even want to be around them. They, are, they were created by and for God, Colossians 1, to, to be image bearers. How can, listen to what he says. He says, how can we seek not to care about and take care and take an interest in those we run across? Just be interested in people. You know, there was, a, there was a guy in the early days when I was on staff at River City Church. I asked Antley this question, who was the pastor there. I said, hypothetical, if you were going to take somebody, and, and I'm, I'm not going to name a bunch of names, but if you're going to take one person off the staff, we had a decent-sized staff at the time, and you had to plant a church and take them, and you can't pick me because I know you would, um, but take them with you to go plant, and who would it be? And he said it would be this guy, and he pointed to a 19 to 20-year-old guy that was on staff, long blonde hair, he's a drummer um, uh, from, from uh, central London, um, goofball kid, but what's interesting is, is me and who, whoever else was standing around at the time nodded their head and said, yeah, I probably would too, and the reason is, is this guy, he, I don't know what it was about him. He, he wasn't the most knowledgeable theologically. He couldn't go through the EEs of evangelism, the four spiritual laws. But this joker knew how to get people into orbit. And he did it not because he had a mission of projects. I need to notch my belt. But he really cared about people. And I remember my early days at that church before I was even on staff, I would ask people, say, hey, man, how'd you end up here at, at River City Church? They'd say, man, I met this guy, his long blonde hair. You know, he's, he's, he's a drummer here, I think. Um, and, and it wasn't he invited me to church. It was, we became friends. And I'm telling you, I'd go to somebody else. They'd say, hey, I was at dinner the other night, and we started talking to this other guy and this other guy. The guy this one guy, he had blonde hair. He was so nice. And we became, his, his name is there. We became friends. I was at a bar the other night. I was hanging out with a couple people at O Brothers downtown in Riverside. And I started hanging out with this guy. And we both play music. He's got long blonde hair. He's like 20 years old. He plays drums really good. And but it was like over half the people in the church. And I kid you not, the reason that they were there and had become a part of the family there at River City Church was this one guy, 19, 20 years old, knucklehead. We all, I mean, I loved him. He worked with me. He was one of the guys that worked in my ministry. I was in student ministry, college ministry, and he was amazing to have. Just powerful, but it was simple what he did. He just, in, he was a machine. He engaged people. But listen to this. I'll just tell you something about him. This is what's crazy. When he, he gave his testimony one time at, at River City and at our, at our college ministry, when he was growing up, highly introverted, he had Asperger's. Like he's, he was on the spectrum, and he, he said, when I was growing up, my, my, I was very scared of people. I didn't even want to engage with my mom and dad. I walked behind them like 15 yards. You know, we, I, I, didn't, I didn't engage with people. I did my own thing. I was in my own world, kind of had my own stuff that I cared about and didn't really care about people, and really that wasn't my thing. And he said, something happened with me spiritually and with God that changed everything, and I had an amazing, thoughtful therapist that worked with me and said, hey, since these aren't built in, you're brilliant on, the, on this stuff. You never need to work on this stuff. But since you're not, this isn't natural for you, you can do this mechanically. Like you can engage people and be, take interest in people and love people and treat people like humans and, and instead of, you know, kind of be in the self-centered world you are, you can do that. You can actually do that with effort, you know, that even though you're not natural at it. And he said, so I just started doing that. And he goes, then I realized I was better than the extroverts at it. And I say that because I think sometimes we, we put ourselves in a personality type. And if you look, I, I could never be this guy. I could never be the you know, blonde-haired British guy that's amazing. He's amazing, plays drums. There's pe reason people. He, he, he would tell you, I'm the last person that would do this. I do it because I, I practice it. I practice it. 
And I just think, man, what an encouragement for the church for us to find ourselves in that place of practicing and allowing the Holy Spirit to change something inside our heart and the way that we do things. It will change things for us. So easy one, engage people. Or again, simple one, not easy. Second one, invite people, and I put in parentheses, to dinner. Uh, because I think that's such an important thing. This is so practical. And the holiness of meals in Scripture, if that's not obvious when you read the Bible, it's all over. Inviting people in for good drink, good food, good feasting, and having conversations about life, love, and God. That is a beautiful and wonderful and holy thing. And in Luke 14, Jesus says, he says, when you do get together, he said, also, he said also to the man who had invited him to the banquet, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite, listen to this, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Now Jesus in context isn't saying don't, that's not a never thing. He's saying, but you need to make a point to do things differently. He says, lest you also, they also invite you in return. In other words, he's saying, hey, if you just always are hanging out with your own people, that's self-serving. You're just serving. You're, they're going to invite you. You're going to invite them. It's the same routine. I got my little corner of the world. We got our little corner of the universe. We got a little click. He's saying, hey, you need to stretch. You need to engage. You need to invite people to dinner from outside your world, which that is when it becomes unselfish. And the only way that that's going to take place is the light of Christ, the, the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Matt Chandler says the only reason that we would extend that type of hospitality is if we have had a regenerated heart. Because naturally, as humans, we won't do it. Why would we? But as regenerated, brought from death to life Christians, that's what's inside you. That's what's working in you. That's what's happening to you that we would invite people in. John Piper says this about practicing hospitality. He says, Here's what happens inside of us. He says, we experience the refreshing joy of becoming, when we extend hospitality, we become, um, we experience the refreshing joy of becoming conduits of God's hospitality rather than being self-decaying cul-de-sacs. I mean, that makes me feel a little guilty the way he says it, but I like it. You know what I mean? It's like that thing that's like, I need that type of conviction. I want to experience the joy of being a conduit. I want, to be, I want to experience the joy of reverberating this amazing news that's inside of me out to the world. And one of the ways that I can do it, the simple way, is to get people in orbit in my world. Get people in proximity to me and my, my friends that have the light of Christ inside of us. It's simple, not easy. He says, you don't, you don't want to be a self-decaying cul-de-sac at the end of your street. You want to experience this refreshing joy. He goes on to say, the joy of receiving God's hospitality decays and dies if it doesn't flourish in our own hospitality to others. So we got a, we got a war against our flesh that our household is our house. I mean, I, that's me. I am the, this, is, this is my castle. This is my refuge. This is my safe place. This is where I hide from everybody else. I mean, that's the United States of America now, right? Nobody's, it's not like, you know, everybody hangs out on the front porch and, hey, come on over, let's do this thing, you know, let's hang out. I mean, people come now, I just saw a comedian, I think I've actually showed a clip of uh, Sebastian Man Maniscalco, but you, 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 like, in the 20, 30 years ago, you know, people come to the door, it's like, come on in, what are you doing, you know, you come in and people stay for two hours. Now the doorbell rings and everybody's like, who is it? Find the gun, honey. I mean, we just aren't as welcoming as we used to be. It's just not the world that we live in. We have to fight this flesh that this is our refuge because your house is not your refuge. Jesus is your refuge. God's gonna, you, might, you might get called to the mission field. You might get called somewhere else. You better find a more non-fragile refuge than your home. I mean, you live on the coast of Florida. I mean, it shouldn't be your refuge. You better be anchored to something a little bit stronger like Almighty God than your house. But we make our houses our refuge. We make our houses our castle, and we think it's ours, but it's not yours. Every good thing that you've gotten, everything that you absorb in your life that is good, it is coming down from our Father in heaven, the Father of heavenly lights, down to you so that you might leverage it for his glory and for the, the good of the people that are around you. Your people, the people in your world that are your neighbors, it should be good news to them that they're near you. You should be, like that God specifically, not only were you created in the image of God, He's placed you in a domain here on planet Earth that you might be good news to the people that are next to you, that are on your street, that are next to you in your cubicle, that are in your world, that participate in the same sports, that do the same things that you do. It should be good news to them that y'all are in proximity to one another. 
we should be inviting those people into our world. Step one, we want to get them in orbit. We need to have a new perspective in the way that we think about this. So when you do invite somebody to dinner, let's get practical. When you do invite somebody in, I think our tendency with hospitality is, you know, we want to, I'm going to, and I, I feel this way because I like the house to look nice and I want to light some things and make it look good. I'm kind of weird that way. Like I want to straighten everything. Let's make it look like HGTV in here, honey, before everybody comes over. And you make it look all nice. And we should do, like you should, you should clean up before people come over. I mean, they should have a place to sit. They should want to come back. Um, but it shouldn't be about you. Because I think sometimes we're like, Listen, we're going to knock this out of the park. We're going to be awesome. But it's interesting. I, I looked at this, this uh, TED Talk on hospitality this guy did um, that ran a restaurant in Colorado. Won every award, international award for amazingness of restaurant. I don't even know what that award is called. If some of you have watched Iron Chef enough, you know. But he gave this talk that had nothing to do with you know, how to serve the food, how to make a great meal, how to do all the stuff. It wasn't any mechanics of service because he's like, that's not hospitality. In fact, he, he d- divides those into two categories. I'll, I'll show you right here. Service and hospitality are different. Service is what you do to someone. Hospitality is how you make someone feel. So he said that's, he goes, how you serve the food from the left and the fact that you hit all the specials and pat yourself on the back and say, we did all the stuff right. He said that, that is not what hospitality is. Hospitality is how did they feel when they came? Did they feel, did they feel better about you or did they feel better about themselves? And I'm like, that is the gospel right there. That's the way that people should enter into our homes. If they've been received into your homes as a stranger and an alien, and now they are part of your friend network, now they are part of it being inside your home, they should all of a sudden be receiving something from you rather than you eliciting something from them as they come in, making you feel like, hey, I did this pretty good. I hosted well. They should leave thinking, man, I, feel, I just feel better as a human being leaving the Harmon household or the Johnson household, or wherever they're leaving from. I love that idea. He even used an example. He said he, he went somewhere, and uh, the chef invi- didn't know who he was, inv- invited him into the back to see the, his five-star restaurant. I mean, it's like seeing, if you're a cooking person, it's like seeing a rock star when you get to go back and see the chef. Invited the, the whole table back to see the, you know, how everything got done, like how, you know, how do we make the stuff. Um, and he said, that right there, that's hospitality. He's like, that's like being at the, the U2 concert. And Bono, you know, says, hey, why don't you come in the back with me? We'll hang out. Making people feel something. We're showing them the light of Christ. We're serving people. We're not serving ourselves. Imagine how this will change city groups. And this is kind of an insider discussion. But imagine your community groups. And if you're visiting and you got community groups, this should be adding this missional element to it. This should be a part of our churches. Like, not that it's not right now, but I think it's great that we open the Bible and read it to one another. It's great that we study the Word of God together. It's great that we do marriage studies together. It's great that we edify ourselves with the the knowledge of the, the Word of God. But if it's not driving us in our city groups to be hospitable and get people into orbit around the people of God and the things of God in the light of Christ that shines in you, then what are we doing anyway? So how about thinking about this and changing the, way, the mode and the goals and the mission? Dave's already kind of in this zone right now. But what it looks like in our city groups every week, like it says in Hebrews, let's not forsake meeting together. We should be instructing one another. We should be challenging one another. How about the challenge when we meet together be, hey, who's inviting people over for dinner? Who's hanging out with people that are in proximity to them to get them in orbit around Jesus? How about we, we just say this week we're going to challenge everybody in here. We're going to... We're gonna, I'm going to invite somebody. In the next two weeks, I'm going to invite somebody into my home that I wouldn't normally invite. That's what I'm going to do. And then you all leave and you go about your business and you come back together and you got some accountability in your city group. Like, hey, let's talk about it. Not just so you can go, ha, 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 you're terrible at this. But so you can encourage one another and hear these amazing stories of God's faithfulness and say, oh my gosh, this person came over. And my other friend actually just popped in for, for a visit. Now all of a sudden we got both of us in there and we're, we're talking and, and it was normal and it started to change the way that things were. Or you have failure stories. I think failure stories are great, especially when somebody's willing to say, it went terrible for me, nobody came over. I don't know, they must think I smell, I don't know what happened. I don't even know how this, uh, this inviting thing's terrible. Because other people in your group are thinking, thank goodness he said that because I failed too. Like you should be, that's the honesty of, because this is not, again, this is simple, it's not easy. 
But then all of a sudden you start to get traction. You realize this isn't just like a drive-by thing. Like I invited this guy, Ted, over for dinner and, you know, I see you, Ted, and I'm never going to see you again. No, it's, it's a lifelong journey with people. It's walking with them, discipleship. What did Jesus do? He took a bunch of knuckleheads. He took 12 of them. And he, three and a half years he was with them. And then he had the inner crew, the three that he was with, Peter, James, and John. This is the Jesus model. This isn't like, you know, Jesus did go hang out with the crowds, and then he would run them all off and just hang out with the 12. Discipleship. So this is getting them in an orbit and then all of a sudden going on the long-haul journey with somebody. Not this, I need to get him to sign something. I need to get him to church so Derek can fix them. It's, I want to be in it with them, discipling them along the journey of seeing who Jesus is, just how amazing he is. That's what we're talking about. And city groups could be that way. Maybe you team up with people in your city group. Some of your city groups are going so well. Like I hear about it. Y'all are all friends. Like you all hang out. That's incredible. Not all the groups are like that. But if you do have a group like that, and you all live in proximity, they're set up that way, it's like, hey, why don't we just take half of them and say, hey, hey, you and you, hey, we can hang out. We all know the, you know, the Carters over there. Let's have, we can go hang out with the Carters. They don't know Jesus, and we, we know them. Our kids all play soccer together. We'll have dinner with them. That won't be weird. Let's do that. And then all of a sudden you're encouraging one another. It's part of the framework. Maybe you do it as a city group. Like we're gonna throw a city group party. It ain't gonna have, it's just gonna have one of those fun slides in the front yard. There's no plan to open the Bible, talk about Jesus or anything. We're just gonna work on orbit. We're just gonna work on hospitality. We're gonna do, we're gonna have fun. And then all of a sudden you got people coming over and you're like, you know it's true, but they don't know. You got, there is 15 people here that love Jesus, and all my neighbors are here with them. We've got people orbiting, and we got people with the light of Christ in them, and they are all mingling together. They are all hanging out together for the singular purpose in my mind and their mind that they might wake up and find out the best news ever that Jesus saves and nothing else does and can change everything about their life. That is a game changer. Are you as excited as me? You don't look like it. I'm kidding. You do. This, it's just crazy to think about. Lastly, love the outsider. So engage people, invite people to dinner, and, and then love the outsider. So I want to do, we've been talking about this, but what does it look like? Well, that continuation of that verse in Luke we read before, who, who do we eat with? He says, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because you, they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. He's saying, hey, when you do invite people, when you are being hospitable, Reach beyond just the norm. Reach to the people that, because here's the reality for you and for me. People outside your world are desperate for Jesus. The enemy wants to lie to you and tell you nobody wants to be around anything that has to do with Jesus. We're in 2020. It's cancel culture. We don't want to be around anything like that. People are open. People are hurting. They are hungry. They are broken. They are desperate, and they are searching you will find that out very, very quickly. That we want to be about the outsider. You know why we want to be about the outsider? Because God has always been about the outsider. I tried, I looked in the Bible and I was like, I'm going to keep looking. For, I keep finding it over and over and over again to, to, to kind of prove the point to myself. And I said, well, I'm going to look and see if even in Leviticus, there's a passage about hospitality and the outsider. I mean, I know y'all are all studying Leviticus and you already know this passage anyway. Um, but Leviticus 19.34 says, You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. In other words, you should treat the stranger like your neighbor. And you shall love him as yourself. And why? He gives the basis. This is amazing right here in Leviticus. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And I am your Lord. He said, you were strangers. You were foreigners. You were aliens. And I came and rescued you out of that. Now you go rescue other people. Isn't that amazing? Right there in the Old Testament. It's radical. You know, I was thinking about this idea of the outsider and the stranger. Anybody know Rosario, Rosario Butterfield? She writes for Gospel Coalition. She writes for a lot of different people. She's amazing. But her story, I'll give her testimony real quick and then we'll end. But she was a uh, professor at uh, Syracuse. She, in queer theory, was her deal. She was the, probably the, the, presi the presiding voice in, in the LGBTQ community for years and years and years. Like, she was the one writing the articles in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Everybody knew who she was, multiple doctorates, absolutely brilliant and sweet and graceful human being. 
like just amazing. And every, I mean, people were just like, we want to lean towards this lady because she knows what she's talking about. That was her jam. Now, obviously, you've got a lot of people that are getting, you know, she would publish something or say something, and then you get a bunch of stuff from the religious right. You get a bunch of stuff coming in this direction. You get all of this. Like she was very, she would publish her works, and then they would write an article about it in the paper, and you'd get all these opinions from different directions. Well, she wrote this one article Cannot remember the title of it, but it was published in the New York Times, and everybody responded online, you know, in the comments, you know, kind of like they do today. And she would go through, and she's, I would read all the comments. Like, I would just blaze through and read all the comments. My assistant would help me cruise through some of them, and she would send some to me that she thought were important. And um, the, obviously, you got people praising her and then people that were condemning her. Uh, and she got this comment from this couple that lived very close to her in upstate New York and said, hey, we live kind of close to each other. I know you don't know us, but here's what we think about your article, which was, and she said was very graceful, very insightful, but obviously not what I believe or think. And they said, hey, I know this sounds crazy, but we'd love to contact you. And so she said, sure. So they contacted her, and in their conversation, it was great. It was a couple. They were, a pa- they were pastors, and she said, can you... You know, do you want to come come hang out? You live very close to us. You want to have dinner with us? And, and Rosario Butterfield said, sure, I will. She'll, I'll bring my pad. This will be research time. You know, I'll do some research on uh, on you. You seem different. I want to, I want to hear. I, th- nobody else really invites me in to their world because I'm the person that does study on queer theory, LGBTQ community. That's just not, you know, there's no ends for me in Christian community right now. And they said, yeah, you come over. We'll hang out. And she said, it, I, what I experienced when I went to their house was absolute off the chart love, grace, and mercy, and fun, good conversation. There was no, you need to give your life to Jesus like day one. There was n- none of that. There was this extension of their home and of the gospel that was happening, and she didn't even know it. And she said, and we, it was great, and I left, and they said, hey, we should do this. We like each other, obviously. You like me, we like you, it's great. We should do this more often. So she said it became a regular thing, you know, once a month, every couple of weeks. She would go hang out, take some notes, do some research, but they hung out, would have dinner. And it didn't, this didn't, Rosario Butterfield's testimony is like, like, overnight, I gave my life to Jesus. I started reading the Bible, and everything changed. But over a couple of years, she said, I, it changed me from the inside out. Their hospitality revolutionized me. And I started opening up the Bible on my own. And I gave my life to Jesus. And, and, and everything didn't change right away. Like, it is a messy and bumpy road. Talk about giving up and, and the, be, being on the wrong side of the fence in every community now that I'm, I've become a believer. I go to this conservative Presbyterian church with my new pastor friend and his wife. And, and I mean, my life changed. And it wasn't clean and neat and tidy. But I gave my life to Jesus and everything changed. And now she, you know, she's, she's married with kids, tours across the country speaking. She's incredible all from hospitality. And this is what she says. She's her prayer for the church. She says, my prayer is for you and me here at Ocean City Church that you let God use your home, your apartment, your dorm room, your front yard, your community gymnasium, or your garden for the purpose of making, listen to this, making strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family. I love that. Because hospitality is no small thing. It's no minor biblical theme in Scripture. It is across the landscape of Scripture. You think about how much we talk about the epistles of Paul. We look at the first half of Colossians and Ephesians. All through them, what is it? You yourself were strangers and aliens to the covenant of Israel, to the promise of Israel. And then what? The hospitable God. This is the basis for our hospitality. But then, you were strangers and aliens. All had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody was walking wet. While you were sinners, Christ died for you. Think about it. But then God, in his great mercy and love, came in and saved you. Gave his life for you. Gave his son as a ransom for you. That you might no longer be a stranger or an alien, but a citizen. That you might be a friend. That you might be a son or a daughter. Not to just a person, but to the king of everything. Isn't that amazing? Hospitality. We have received hospitality. We look up at the cross and we see 
a hospitable God that opened up his life, opened up his most valuable resources, opened up everything he possibly could for you and me. Didn't hold anything back, not even his son. And Jesus bled out on the cross that you and I might walk through the threshold of God's house in his presence and approach the throne of grace with no fear because he was hospitable. That is the engine for you and for me. If that doesn't make you want to swing wide your front door and invite people in, I don't know what will. Let's stand. God, we love you. We are so excited to be loved by you. We didn't pay for it. We didn't earn it. We didn't work for it. Even when we were walking away, when we were sinners, when we were rebellious, when we thought we knew what we wanted, when we thought we knew how to save ourselves, you died for us. You never gave up on us. You came in to rescue us. Just come, continue to do that. Even for the strangers, the people that feel lonely and cut off and as a stranger in this room, I gotta pray right now that your grace and your mercy through your Holy Spirit will begin to enter in, will open up their eyes to see that you are the king that you love them and you're calling them home. Just come, Holy Spirit.